Good morning. Did you enjoy getting that extra hour of sleep last night? Yeah, it seems like y'all are a little more lively this morning than usual. Maybe you've had a little extra hour to get the coffee circulating, I don't know. Uh, the title of today's message is, How Would Jesus Vote? Have you ever wondered about that? If Jesus all of a sudden incarnated, took on flesh, became a U.S. citizen, how do you think Jesus would vote? Don't answer out loud. <laughs> you know, years ago they had those t-shirts, WWJD, bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I can't help but wonder, what, what would Jesus do this Tuesday when it comes time to vote? How would Jesus vote or would he even vote? A while back, Chad and I had a discussion on whether Jesus would even participate or not. You know, some religious groups, uh, they do not vote. They do not, do not believe in it. I saw an interview on TV and somebody was interviewing an Amish person and uh, they just said, no, we don't vote. Apparently there's some others like the Plymouth Brethren, some groups along those lines. Uh, they take Jesus' comments about not being of this world and not being entangled in the world, etc. to mean that they should not participate, that they should not vote. So I suppose if I asked them, how would Jesus vote? They would probably say, well, he wouldn't vote. So it made me think, well, would Jesus vote or would he not vote? Where do I stand on the issue? Well, I do not know for sure, but based upon my opinion, which is backed up by Scripture, of course, I think he would vote. Here's why. James chapter 4, verse 17 states, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You see, it's a sin not to do good when you, in fact, can do it. And I believe that when we vote in this country, we have a chance to influence our country for the good. That's why I believe Jesus would vote in this presidential election. Along these same lines, it's been said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. With our vote, I believe we have the opportunity to do something good. And thinking along those lines, I think Jesus would vote because it is an opportunity to do good, or at least strive to do good. Now this morning I want to talk about a moral issue in this election uh, where we have a tremendous opportunity to do good with our vote. And the, and the moral issue is of such moral magnitude that all other issues pale in comparison to it. You know, I'm not going to talk about health care this morning. I'm not going to talk about uh, Social Security and whether we should invest it in the stock market or, or somehow let the government keep handling it, or should we raise taxes? I'm not going to talk about big government, you know, as opposed to smaller government. I'm not even going to go off in the weeds and talk about uh, the various candidates and their moral failings. You know, I could just launch out on a tirade. I could talk about Donald Trump, say he's just a, a misogynistic, uh, you know, he's a narcissistic, uh, sexist pig. I could, go, I could go into that and you could say, John, where are you saying that? I could say, hey, I heard it with my own ears on tape. Some of you are getting mad about now. And for those of you who are loving it, let me say this, Hillary Clinton, I mean, she, I, could, I, could, I could launch into a tirade on how she's corrupt and crooked and it's coming out on tapes every day. Those are important issues, but they are not the most important issue. I want to talk about the most important issue this morning. I'm not going to talk about the character of the candidates. I'm not going to talk about secular issues. By the way, I don't think as, as a minister I should even address certain secular issues that aren't mentioned in Scripture. I think where the Bible speaks, the preacher ought to speak, and where the Bible is silent, the preacher needs to keep his mouth shut. You agree with that? It's okay. You can give me an amen on that one. And so this morning, I'm, I'm not going to get off in the weeds and talk about some of these peripheral issues. I'm going to talk about the most important issue this morning, and that is the abortion issue. I wish abortion wasn't even in this election. I wish it had never reared its ugly head in politics. I wish all the political candidates would dismiss it from their platforms. Uh, I, and I am somewhat optimistic that one day this will happen. 
I really am. I think one day we're going to see when the major parties have totally dismissed this. You say, well, why, why are you so optimistic? Well, I see the way uh, the country is going mentally when it comes to this because uh, abortions have steadily gone down since uh, Roe v. Wade in 1973. Well, specifically since 1990. Let me back up. Since 1990, the abortions have been going down. So that's good. It shows that the, the pro-life forces are having an impact uh, on our country, which is a good thing. Then there was another victory won on April 18, 2007, when partial birth abortion uh, was banned. It became a law by the Supreme Court. Again, April 18, 2007, in case you don't know what a partial birth abortion is, I'm not going to get into all the gory details, and believe me, you, you could go there, but it's when the baby is partially outside the mother's womb and the baby's killed. That's a partial birth abortion. That has been outlawed, but some in this race actually are for that which is incredibly troubling to me. That's why it's important that we vote, because we have the chance to do good. You see, whoever is elected president, they get to choose the Supreme Court justices. And the Supreme Court justices decide whether or not abortion is going to be legal or illegal. You see, we have to vote responsibly. It's as simple as this. We send people to Washington who are pro-life, and ideally, now some sell out and some lie and do that kind of thing, but ideally, we send pro-life forces to Washington. They change the legislation. They put people on the courts that will reverse this trend of abortion. You may say, John, you're not supposed to be mixing church and state in the pulpit. You shouldn't bring up uh, politics. And again, in a sense, uh, I, I agree with you. I'm not here this morning to talk really about politics. And As a side note, let me say this. The separation of church and state is not even in the Constitution. Go try to look it up. All it says there is the state's not supposed to establish a religion. But number two, if you're a part of God's church, and when you grab the lever or push the button or pencil in, you've just joined church and state because you're the church, and that's the state, and y'all have come together. How about that? So sometimes we carry this too far and put a muzzle on the preacher and say he can't say anything about anything like that, and that, that's totally not true. But again, I'm not going to delve into all these peripheral issues, I'm going to stick with the one that I believe is the utmost importance. And believe me, it would be a lot easier for me just to dodge this issue because it's such an emotionally charged issue. Some of you may be angry with me right now. Some of you may leave here with me angry. Some of you might not even make it through the message this morning. I have addressed this issue before. I usually I pick, I, I speak on this right before the election because I want to remind people of just how important it is because we have a tendency, I've noticed, as Americans to get desensitized. We, we, we are, we're offended at first, and then we get used to the idea, kind of like the frog in the boiling water. You just turn it up a little and a little, and then finally he, he boils, and, and then, and then he's, he's dead. But drop him in when it's already hot, and he just hops right out or tries to. Sometimes we get that way as Americans, and we, we've seen this on the gay marriage issue. Now it's just kind of becoming, ah, ah, just, that's old news, and we go along with it, when we should be appalled and offended at it. And it is a political issue too, but that's not the one I want to address today, but it is important. The abortion issue is the same way. I, I've, I've been encountering Christians, and I, and I, and I bring this up, and, and they say, yeah, but, and then and, and they want to ignore it. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, they weren't willing to ignore it. Nah, just kind of kind of getting used to it now. I was watching the O'Reilly Factor a while back, and they had a couple of ministers in the no-spin zone. And these, uh, these ministers were going to vote for, for pro abortion candidates and for president and O'Reilly was saying well how can you be a Christian and vote for killing baby I mean how, how does this work and they said well, well it's just a one plank in the party in other words it's not well, we don't really like it we're not for it but it's just it's just one plank in the party and we're gonna go with all these other things over here we like I'm here to tell you that a human life is more than a plank in the party it is dangerous to think like that what can be more important than a human life? What issue could be more important than that? Now, I want you to think heavy with me right now. Would it not be better to be a communist that's pro-life than a capitalist who's pro-abortion? Think about that. You see, a life is far more important than some political philosophy 
or some political system, let alone a political leader. You see, it's dangerous to blindly follow some party. It's dangerous to blindly follow some man. As far as politicians go, please hear me on this. I'm not here to, to embrace some political party or some, some man or some woman. I want you to know something. I'm a Christian first, not a Republican, not a Democrat, independent, reform, libertarian, green, or whatever. I'm a Christian first, and God has my allegiance above every other political system. I try to go with whoever best represents God's values that, is, that are found in His Word. Because one day I'm going to have to give an account for how I voted or didn't vote. And you are too. Now maybe you can get before God and try to explain, oh God, that was just a plank in the party. <laughs> maybe you can try to get away with that. I don't know. Oh yeah, God, I don't believe in gay marriage. But you know, I voted for a candidate that supported it. I sent people to Washington that are, that are promoting that. Uh, but, yeah, but, 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 you know, I don't know. Me personally, I'm not going to try to go before God with the buts. I want to say, God, I, I tried to do the good that was put before me. And I hope that one day you can say the same thing. It is incredibly dangerous to blindly follow any political party. You see, that's how the Nazi party came into power. They just followed their party. Maybe their daddy was a good Nazi. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe grandpa was not. Our family's been Nazis for the last, you know, they got us out of the depression, blah, blah, blah. And just walked in, pardon the pun, lockstep. And, and we look at all the evil that followed. You have to be careful. You can't just follow a party. Now, I know some of you are saying, John, and I know this, but I feel like it needs to be stated uh, sometimes. Uh, here, here, here's the central question in the whole debate. When does life begin? Think about that for a moment. When does life begin? When it comes to the unborn in the womb, are we talking about a person or not? Are we dealing with an individual that's important to God or just the tissue that has the potential to become human and has not yet done so? You see, the way we answer that question makes all the difference in the world. If we say the unborn is a person, then no one has the right to intentionally take that person's life. If we say the unborn is not a person, then to abort becomes nothing more than some innocent procedure like removing a toenail. That's the real question. When does life begin? Are we dealing with a person or not when we talk about the unborn in the womb? And, and I believe this is a question we need to a answer urgently within ourselves. Uh, let, let me tell you this. For, for years... I was a Christian and I never even thought about this issue. It's not something I wanted to think about. I didn't want to think about this. I, I think about anything but this. But I don't think it's, a, it's an issue that we can just dismiss and pretend that it's not happening. Because uh, according to one statistic I came across, came across uh, since Roe v. Wade in 1973, there's been 58 million plus abortions in this country. Now, if those are human beings, 58 million that is a lot of people. We're talking about depopulating the country. And, and, and in, in large measure, that, that has taken place. Uh, some statistics have the abortions up around 1.2 million a year in America, some a little lower, some a little higher. Um, that comes to about 3,000 a day, 137 an hour, two a minute. Wow. Now, are we talking about people being annihilated or something else? If we're not talking about lives being taken, we're just talking about, you know, roughly one million procedures a day. But if we're talking about a life, if these are lives being taken, if babies in the womb are seen as a life, that makes our country more murderous than Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia during the 30s and 40s. Think about that. Our nation is more murderous if these are lives in the womb. So it's very important that we answer this question correctly. 
And I, I'm, I'm speaking truthfully to you here this morning. I really believe that there's nothing more important than a human life. What could be more important? It's more important than your social security. Is it not? It, it, it's, it's more in, in, in important than your taxes. It's more important than some government service if we're talking about a life. So when does life begin? Let's look at a few verses from Scripture, and I think we can kind of get an idea of when life begins. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 44. This one doesn't specifically answer when life begins, but it, it lets you know that certainly at some point the baby in the womb is alive. This is Elizabeth speaking to, to Mary. She said, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. That's Elizabeth speaking to Mary. She's talking about the baby in her womb being John the Baptist. And as soon as John the Baptist heard Mary's voice, even though he's in the womb, as soon as he heard her voice, he leaped with joy. Now, did you catch that? The baby was capable of hearing. The baby was capable of responding. The baby was capable of experiencing the motion of joy. That sounds human to me. What do y'all think? How could an imp personal mass of tissue be capable of hearing, responding, and experiencing joy. We're not talking about an impersonal blob here. We're talking about a person. No doubt about it. Now let's look at Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. God's speaking here. Before I formed you in the womb, talking to Jeremiah, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Key word there is formed. Jeremiah, the person, was formed by God in his mother's womb. Furthermore, God knew Jeremiah as a person, not only during the pregnancy, but before the pregnancy. Wow. <laughs> Apparently, personhood begins even before conception. Wrap your mind around that. This ver verse certainly indicates and certainly teaches that the unborn person the baby in the womb, I should say, is a person. We see it with John the Baptist. We see it here with Jeremiah. Then look at what David says in Psalm 139, 13. He says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Here David is saying that God formed his body and his personality in his mother's womb, and notice the image you're used. He's saying that God knit him together in his mother's womb. Let me, let me ask you this. What so-called doctor has the right to unknit the person in the womb that God is knitting together? I don't believe any man on this earth has the right to do that. I don't believe it's anything short of murder. It has been said, God doesn't wait until a baby moves or becomes completely ready for life outside his womb before he knows it, loves it, and recognizes it as a tiny human being. Not only does Scripture indicate that the baby is a living person inside the mother's womb, science seems to indicate that as well. Bear with me. This, this could get a little technical, maybe a little technical for me, maybe not for you, but it says that we know that the male sperm and the female egg each contains 23 chromosomes. Upon fertilization, a single cell results containing 46 chromosomes and 30,000 genes, which determines hair, color, skin, facial features, and even certain qualities of the personality. The new organism's 46 chromosomes are in a different combination than those of either parent. The new organism is unique. It's not an organ of the mother's body, but a different individual. This cell produces specifically human proteins and enzymes from conception. 
Francis Click, the Nobel laureate and biophysicist, estimates that the amount of information contained in the chromosomes of a single fertilized human egg is equivalent to about 1,000 printed volumes of books, each as large as the Encyclopedia Britannica. So obviously, uh, such a, a creature is not, as Roe v. Wade says, a potential life. It is a life. So we see both from science and scripture, the unborn in the womb is a person. And if it's a person and it's killed, is that not murder? I mean, this is pretty simple. Abortion kills babies. Now people throw up all these arguments and smoke screens and, you know, nobody has a right to tell a woman what she can do with her body. The police do it every day. The police tell a woman what she can do with her body and what she can't do with her body. She can't rob a store. She can't shoplift. She can't come up and kill you. She can't drive drunk. Same lines. So you can't legislate morality. <laughs> yes, you can. They do it every day. Police legislate morality. They make laws to legislate morality. A lot of these smoke screens out there. And then they say, well, you know, well, you know, what about rape and incest? Well, you know, if you study the statistics, somewhere around 1% or less of abortions are for rape or incest. The vast majority of abortions are simply a means of birth control. If you want to really strip it down, get down, shuck it down to the, to the, get down to the corn of the cob, so to speak, it's all about the worship of the God of pleasure. It's to get rid of an inconvenience. And we just act like it's a choice. And it's not murder. I believe that's sick. A little over a year ago, I remember seeing on TV, on tape, heard it with my own ears, so I've been spun or something, where they're actually selling body parts. Is that the kind of society we want to live in? I'm telling you, when historians look back, they're going to say that, was, that, that culture was getting sick right there. Actually killing their babies and selling the body parts. Now that ought to make us sick. It ought to make us irate. We should not give any politician a pass when it comes to that. And yet, people are willing to do it. I'm hesitant to go here, but I'm going here. There's even a racial component to this. Do you realize that four times, on percentages, four times as many black babies are aborted as white babies? Four times as many. Yet, it's never mentioned. 17 million black babies have been aborted since 1973. When you look at the census reports, that's... That demographic, African-American demographic, has not grown as much as the other groups, and this is part of the reason why. And yet, most civil rights leaders, not all, most remain silent. Why? Do those black lives not matter? Yes, they do matter. You see, we've got a whole lot of people playing politics. We've got people not speaking out that should speak out. You've got people calling themselves ministers that aren't preaching God's word. They've got... All corruption at all levels. But we as God's people have been called to be the salt of the earth. The light of the world. We're not supposed to buy in. We're supposed to speak up when we need to speak up. I tell you, as a preacher, I know one day I'm going to go before God. And His Word tells me that as a teacher, I'm going to be judged more strictly than you are. And a lot of these so-called preachers are going to be judged more strictly than you are. Because God's going to hold us accountable for what we preached and what we didn't preach. And there's a whole lot of people out there right now, they're not speaking up. I would dare say, I don't know this for sure, there's a lot of churches today that aren't even talking about this. You know why? Because they don't want to offend anybody. Now, I don't want to offend y'all either. You're not, those of you who I know, I love you. I care about you. I don't enjoy offending you. If I'm offending you, I hope I'm not. I don't enjoy that. But I'm kind of between a rock and a hard place here. Am I supposed to worry more about offending you or offending God? I don't think you want a preacher that's more worried about offending you than offending God. 
And see, I can go before him and say, God, I spoke up. All this infanticide, this, 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 this killing and taking of innocent life, I spoke up. I didn't support it. Any politician that supports it, I throw them to the side. I'm not going along with it. So that's just one issue, preacher. That's just one issue. Yeah, but it's the most important issue. And I'll tell you right now, if enough Christians would stand up and say, we're not going along with this, both parties would get rid of it just like that. The only reason they keep it alive is because they got enough people going along with it. It's all about satisfying certain constituency groups. But if God's people stood together and says, we're not putting up with that, we're not putting up with this, we're not going along, we could get everything right back on track. And as I mentioned earlier, I think we're going to get it back on track with this abortion issue. It's, it's moving in the right direction. Well, there's less and less of them. The message is getting out. Some people are speaking up. We're making headway. I believe we're going to get there. But we just need to make sure that we're part of the solution and not part of the problem. And I want you to, to be innocent on this issue. I don't want any of the blood to be on any of your hands. So that's why I'm speaking up. I think about this uh, story I heard, actually uh, read about about a, a man in Germany during, during World War II. He was a German man. He was an el, older man, and he, he, he was a Christian. And he said they heard rumors about what was going on, how all these Jews were being shipped off and, and put in the death camps and put in the ovens and, and murdered and killed. He said they heard stories about it. But then they started finding out the truth about it. You see, when they would gather on Sunday mornings to have worship service, They'd hear the train whistle blow in the distance. Then they would hear the clacking of the train wheels. And then as the freight train got a little closer with the cattle cars, they started to hear people screaming for their lives as they were on the train going by. And it was pretty loud. And it was very disturbing. They finally figured out who these people were inside these cattle cars. They were Jews being sent off to the death camps. And they grew to hate the sound of that train whistle on Sunday mornings. They would hear the train whistle. They'd hear the clacking of the, of the rail cars. And then the next thing they would hear is these people crying out for their lives as the train went by the church. Couldn't stand hearing it. So as soon as they heard the train whistle sound, they started having congregational singing. And as the, the screams got louder from the train cars, they, they said, well, we just started to sing louder so we wouldn't hear it. The man said, years have passed and no one talks about it much anymore, but I still hear them crying out for help. God, forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians and did nothing to intervene. With over one million unnecessary abortions being performed every year in America, we must not become guilty of simply singing louder to ignore this issue. I've heard it said that most people vote their pocketbooks, but I believe we would be wise to vote our conscience. Yes, I believe Jesus would vote. I believe Jesus would vote pro-life. And so should you.